A very good evening aspirants welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the day 18th of January 2022 we have an announcement today Shankar IAS Academy has designed a refresher course called as CSAT plus the idea behind it is even though some aspirants score good marks in GS paper and prelims they find it very challenging to qualify in the civil services aptitude test paper shortly called as the CSAT paper so to help students to easily qualify for the CSAT Shankar IAS Academy has come up with this course which starts on 27th January 2022 The class timing will be from 5:30 p.m. to 8 p.m. The program is also available in online mode. The admission is now open and by joining one will get the following benefits. Complete overview of CSAT course, shortcuts for time management and accuracy, toppers interaction sessions, strategy to select easy and eliminate difficult questions which fetch more marks. strategy to improve and manage the english skills to understand the question and previous year csat paper analysis so aspirants may use this opportunity to come out with flying colors in csat paper to register for the program please visit the link given in the description below displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today the first article here it talks about the interstate water disputes act Under this article discussion we are going to see examples of rivers over which states have disputes and we are going to see some of the important provisions of the act issues with it and some reforms that are needed to be taken for avoiding such disputes in the future The second article which is a text and context article this is about the child labor we are going to discuss what is child labor in some of the measures taken by the international organizations and indian government for the eradication of child labor the third article it is an editorial article under this we are going to see the importance of livestock for the farmers and the issues in the livestock sector and the measures taken by the government to overcome them moving on to the next text in context article under this article discussion we are going to see about the issues in india nepal relations and the next article here is about kathak and the final article here it is about tsunami under these two article discussion we are going to see some basic facts from prelims point of view without any delay let's get into our discussion see this news article here it talks about the recent comment made by the chief minister of karnataka mr basavaraj bommai in relation to the interstate river water disputes act 1956 the chief minister went on to say that time has come to revisit the entire law because the law is creating more disputes instead of resolving them He felt this way because many irrigation projects in Karnataka have been delayed due to the interstate river water disputes with neighboring Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Goa and Andhra Pradesh. He suggested that the Interstate River Water Disputes Act should have multifold levels of dispute resolution. focusing mainly on maximum utility of a river basin capacity and also the use of technology. The chief minister also said that laws relating to environment, forest, investment and coastal regulation zone CRZ need to be revisited to accelerate the speed of infrastructure development and development of tourism in the state. So that is all about the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss some important provisions of the Interstate River Water Disputes Act and also we'll discuss some issues with the act and some reforms that are needed to address river water disputes in India. This discussion is important for your mains preparation. So pay close attention. First of all, the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. Just go through it. Now let us start our discussion. First of all let us see some data that can be asked in prelims. The data is nothing but major rivers of India and the states that have disputes over it. The first one is the infamous Kaveri. The states in dispute are Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Union Territory Puducherry. Then moving on let's see about River Krishna. The states in dispute are Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Telangana. Then we'll move to see Godavari. The states in dispute are Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh and Odisha. Now we'll see Mahanadi. 
The states in dispute are Chhattisgarh, Odisha. Now let's see about Narmada. The states in dispute are Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Maharashtra and Rajasthan. Then comes the rivers Ravi and Bias. The states in dispute are Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan. Now let us see this river Mahadayi. The states in dispute are Goa, Maharashtra, Karnataka. See the river Mahadayi or Mandovi river is a west flowing river. That is it flows in the west direction and it will drain into the Arabian Sea. The river originates in Beemgarh Wildlife Sanctuary which is in the Belagavi district of Karnataka. This rainfed river flows through Karnataka, Maharashtra and Goa. This river along with Zuwari are the two primary rivers in the state of Goa. So these are some of the important points regarding the river Mahadayi. Just know that the states in dispute are Goa, Maharashtra and Karnataka. Now let us see about this river Vamsadara and the states in dispute are Andhra Pradesh and Odisha. See here river Vamsadara is an east flowing river that is it flows in the east direction and it will drain into the Bay of Bengal. It originates in Kalahandi district of Odisha. After flowing in Odisha it flows along the boundary of Odisha between Andhra Pradesh and Odisha. Then it flows through Andhra Pradesh and finally it drains into the Bay of Bengal. So having seen about these major rivers in India and states which are in dispute over these rivers now let us see some important provisions of the Interstate River Water Disputes Act See the parliament has enacted Interstate River Water Disputes Act 1956 It was enacted for the adjudication of disputes relating to waters of interstate rivers and river valleys See if there is a dispute between states in sharing a river they have to take up this to the central government the central government if it is convinced that the issue cannot be solved using negotiation then a water disputes tribunal is constituted for the adjudication of the dispute note here this provision means unless the states ask for it the center has no role to play now let us see the composition of the tribunal it shall consist of a chairman and and two other members nominated for this by the chief justice of india the chairman and the members while nominated should be judges of the supreme court or high court the central government may in consultation with the tribunal appoint two or more persons as assessors to advise the tribunal in its proceedings Once the tribunal pronounces its decision or awards the central government should publish it in the official gazette see the award is binding on all parties concerned the decision of the tribunal after its publication in the official gazette will have the power as an order or decree of the supreme court after this the central government shall form an authority to implement the award of the tribunal So what is the procedure here if there is a dispute between states in sharing a river they should take it up to the central government and if the central government is convinced that it cannot be resolved using negotiation then a tribunal is formed and after the tribunal pronounces its award it should be published in the official gazette and it has the power of an order of the supreme court and after that the central government should appoint an authority to implement the award of the tribunal See earlier we saw various water disputes right for all these water disputes tribunal have been set up but currently in India only 5 interstate water dispute tribunals are active let us see what they are Ravi and Bias water tribunal Krishna water disputes tribunal to Mahadayi water disputes tribunal Vamsadara water disputes tribunal and Mahanadi water disputes tribunal we saw so many examples but only these 5 tribunals are active now So far we saw different examples of interstate river water disputes and some of the provisions of the act and we saw the tribunals that are active now now we'll see the amendment of the interstate river water disputes act see in 2002 the act was amended to include some recommendations of sarkaria commission firstly when there is a request to create a tribunal it must be established within 1 year Secondly the tribunal must give the award within 3 years but in some cases two more years can be given so the tribunal must give the award within the maximum period of 5 years thirdly if the tribunal award given by the tribunal is not effectively implemented and the concerned state parties may seek clarification within 3 months of the award So these three are the amendments that has been brought into the act which are recommended by the Sarkaria Commission. 
Having said that, now let us see some of the issues with the act, irrespective of the amendments. The foremost issue is delay. Though the time limit is 5 years, Ravi and Bias took 33 years, Kaveri consumed 29 years and other tribunals took around a decade each. This is a major issue. And secondly, we saw that the award of the tribunal is final and binding. But the states can approach the Supreme Court under Article 136, which is Special Leave Petition. This will also cause further delay. And hence, this is also an issue. And thirdly, all of the members of the tribunal are from judicial background. We saw the composition of the tribunal, right? It consists of chairman and two members appointed by Chief Justice of India who should be judges of Supreme Court or High Court. So clearly they are from judicial background. This makes the bench of the tribunal similar to a bench of Supreme Court. There is no representation from experts in river management. This is a major issue. And finally, the act is against federalism. See, even in case of a serious dispute, a state cannot directly approach the tribunal. A state has to go to the centre to refer an interstate dispute to a tribunal. So, this is against the principle of federalism. So, these are some of the issues regarding Interstate Water Disputes Act. Now, let us see what are the reforms that could be made and alternative steps that could be taken to address the issue of the dispute. First of all, River Basin Management Bill should be implemented. What is this bill? What is the objective of it? See, the bill aims at optimum development of interstate rivers by facilitating interstate cooperation using proper scientific planning of land and water resources. So, it is nothing but the optimum usage of rivers by facilitating state cooperation using scientific planning. And it works on the principles of participation, cooperation, equitable and sustainable use of water. In case of any dispute between the states, the bill proposes persuasion, conciliation and mediation for effective and fast dispute resolution. So, this will bring down interstate river disputes. So, as a reform, this bill should be implemented. Second is, the Interstate River Water Disputes Amendment Bill 2019 should be implemented. See, under this bill, it proposes the creation of dispute resolution committees. What is this dispute resolution committee? It will seek to resolve the dispute through negotiations within one year, which can be extended up to six months. And it should submit its report to the central government. Note here that only if the disputes are not resolved by the dispute resolution committee, it will be referred to the tribunal. What is the original case? The states will take up the matter to the central government. If they feel that the dispute can't be resolved by negotiation, then the central government will form a tribunal. But here, only if the disputes are not resolved by the dispute resolution committee, it is referred to the tribunal. See, the next provision under the bill is, it also plans to establish a data bank. According to this, the central government should maintain a data bank and information system at the national level for each river basin. The data bank will help in river management and help address the disputes in a scientific manner. Moving on, there are also some suggestions to create a single permanent national tribunal. See, constituting a tribunal for each dispute is a tedious and time-consuming process. If there is a permanent national tribunal, the dispute resolution process can be simplified, right? Moving on, some of the alternative dispute resolution methods like Track 2 Diplomacy can also be followed. See, Track 2 Diplomacy is the practice of non-governmental, informal and unofficial contacts and activities between private citizens. The Kaveri family was one such attempt. Formed in 2003, it brought together farmers from both Karnataka and Tamil Nadu to initiate a farmer-to-farmer -farmer dialogue and solve the dispute. The Kaveri family was able to create an atmosphere wherein the farmers of both the states would sit down and hear out each other's concern. See, efforts like this will also bring down the interstate river water disputes. And finally, in addition to this, politics must be separated from interstate river water disputes. Only by using scientific and environmental methods can a permanent solution be brought to the interstate river disputes. So, with this, we have come to the end of our discussion. Now, let's have a quick recap. First of all, we saw the examples of river water disputes in India. We saw about the river Kaveri. Krishna, Godavari, Mahanadi, Narmada, Ravi and Bayas, 
Mahadayi and Vamsadara. And we moved on to see about some of the provisions of the Interstate River Water Disputes Act 1956. So according to this if there is a dispute between states it should take it up to the central government and if central government is not convinced that the dispute cannot be resolved by negotiation then it will form a water disputes tribunal and we saw the composition of the tribunal which includes chairman and two other members and the central government in consultation with the tribunal may appoint two or more members for assessing the proceedings and after that we saw the tribunals which are active now which include ravi and bias krishna mahadayi vamsadara and mahanadi water disputes tribunal and after this we moved on to see the amendment of 2002 which included the recommendations of sarkaria commission and after that we saw some of the issues with the act the first one is delay the second one is appealing in the supreme court which also causes further delay and the third one is no representation of experts in the tribunal and fourth one is it is against the principle of federalism and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the reforms that can be brought to reduce the interstate river disputes the first one is the implementation of river basin management bill 2019 and the second one is interstate river water disputes amendment bill 2019 under which which it mandated to form dispute resolution committees and also mandated the establishment of data bank and as a third reform we saw that creating a permanent single national tribunal will simplify the resolution process and after that we saw informal alternative dispute resolution systems like the track to diplomacy and we saw an example under this which is the kaveri family and we also saw that politics must be separated from the interstate river water disputes so with these points in mind let's move on to the next article discussion see let us take up this text in context article it talks about the continuing menace of child labor It is written based on a research study which focuses on why child labor persists. So in this discussion let us understand child labor and measures taken to eradicate it. We'll also see the reason for why these measures didn't materialize and what needs to be done. But before that the syllabus relevant to the topic is given here for your reference. Please make a note of it. First of all what is child labor? Simply it means a child is involved in labor like an adult and United Nations has an apt definition for it according to it the child labor is the work carried out by a child which is detrimental and causes endangerment of the child it also includes those works which are in violation of international law and national legislations against child labor see why child labor is gaining this much attention we'll see why see child labor makes the children to lose their childhood it also deprives children of schooling or it requires them to assume the dual burden of schooling and work we all know that children are the supporting pillars of india this early opportunities for skill development should not be curtailed by child labor and that is exactly why it is essential to eradicate child labor in india So in this context many initiatives have been taken by international community and India to eradicate this social evil. One such measure is the declaration of World Day against child labor by the International Labour Organization ILO in 2002. This day is observed on June 12th every year. This program is aimed at focusing attention on the global extent of child labor and the action and efforts needed to eliminate it. In addition to this the ILO has two important mandates focusing on child labor. The first one is minimum age convention of 1973. It is commonly known as the convention number 138. Its primary aim is ensuring effective abolition of child labor and raising the minimum age for admission to employment. So it stipulates that the minimum age at which the children can start work should not be below the age of compulsory schooling. Let us say that children should get compulsory schooling till the age of 16. So here the minimum age at which the children can start work should not be less than 16. I gave you this example just for your understanding. Note that the minimum age is not 16. According to ILO, in any case, the minimum age at which the children can start work should not be less than 15 years. But there are some exceptions to it which are given to developing countries. Now moving on to the second one this is called as the worst forms of child labor convention of 1999 this is commonly known as convention number 
It aims at immediate elimination of these worst forms of child labor for children below the age of 18 years. Here in this image the worst forms of child labor are given. It includes slavery, trafficking of children, debt bondage, serfdom, forced or compulsory labor, prostitution, pornography, offering children for illicit activities such as trafficking of drugs and work which by its nature is likely to harm the health safety or morals of children now let us come to the steps taken by the indian government to eliminate child labor first is framing a legislation for this purpose this legislation is called child labor act of 1986 This act was a result of recommendations of Gurupada Swami Committee of 1979. Primarily, the act prohibited the employment of children in certain specified hazardous occupations and regulated the working conditions in other occupations. But the act was amended in 2016 and now we have Child Labour Prohibition and Regulation Amendment Act of 2016. This act prohibits the employment of children below the age of 14 years in all employment. See some time back we saw that according to ILO the minimum age for employment of children is 15 and above right but in India it's 14 and above. So this is the exception that we were talking about that were given to developing countries. Okay now coming back to the act The act also prohibits the employment of adolescents in the scheduled hazardous occupations and processes. Secondly, India also has constitutional provisions for the protection of children. We have Article 21A which is nothing but the right to education. It mandates state to provide free and compulsory education to all children belonging to the age of 6 to 14 years. And we have Article 24 It prohibits employment of children under 14 in factories or mine or in any hazardous employment and we have article 39 it states that it is the state's policy to focus on ensuring the tender age of children is not abused and citizens are not forced by economic necessity to enter a minor occupation that is unsuited to their age or strength But even though we have all these measures still child labor is not eradicated one of the reasons for this is found by the research study called perverse consequences of well intentioned regulation evidence from india's child labor ban the reason cited for continuing child labor is insufficient enforcement of legislations on child labor in developing countries this happens due to the weak institutions in the developing countries So from this we can come to the conclusion that having legislations alone is not enough to eradicate child labor. Due to these weak institutions, the cost of hiring children does not increase for corrupt employers. Why? Because they have many children who seek employment due to poverty. And since there is a ban on child labor, there is no need for those corrupt employers to pay more to these children. Therefore here again the child is in a disadvantageous position and this has spillover effect on the economic status of the children and their families that is such ban of child labor in turn affects the wage of children who are employed when they are paid less the poor poverty stricken family is compelled to send their other children also to work this is what is concluded by the study here it does not mean that child labor should not be banned it should definitely be banned but along with it the wage loss faced by the poverty stricken family should be taken care of by supporting policy measures then only the family will not be compelled to send their children to work and they will have resources to tend to their children this is particularly important in the pandemic times where more households are pushed into poverty thereby pushing vulnerable children into child labor so ultimately it is the duty of the government to institute support mechanisms so with this we have come to the end of our discussion let's have a quick recap first of all we saw the definition of child labor which is child involving in labor like an adult and we also saw the united nations definition of it which is nothing but the work carried out by a child which is detrimental and causes endangerment of the child and we saw the reason why child labor should be eradicated because it makes the children to lose their childhood and it deprives children of schooling or it requires them to assume the dual burden which is both schooling and work and after that we saw the initiatives taken by the international community which is nothing but the ILO 
under that we saw the declaration of world day against child labor which is june 12th every year and after that we saw two mandates focusing on child labor by the ilo number 1 is minimum age convention of 1973 also called as convention 138 which aims at ensuring effective abolition of child labor and raising the minimum age which should not be less than 15 years but there are exceptions the second one is worst forms of child labor convention of 1999 also called as the convention number 182 which aims at eliminating the worst forms of child labor for children below 18 years and after that we saw the steps taken by the indian government which included the legislation child labor prohibition and regulation act of 1986 and we saw the amendment to it which is the act of 2016 according to which the minimum age should not be less than 14 years in all employments and we moved on to see the constitutional provisions which includes article 21a article 24 and article 39 and finally we saw some points from the research study perverse consequences of well intentioned regulation evidence from india's child labor ban under the study we saw that legislation alone is not enough enforcement is crucial for ab- abolishing child labor and we also saw that poverty is also a reason why families are sending their children to work in order to address the poverty aspect of child labor it is the duty of the government to institute support mechanisms for them with these key takeaway points let's move on to the next article discussion Look at this editorial article. This article is with reference to the recently held livestock census by the Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy. So in this context, let us understand the role of livestock in farmer economy, issues in the sector and some of the measures taken by the government in this regard. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the topic is given here for your reference. Please make a note of it. See the livestock, it plays an important role in Indian economy, especially in farmer economy. It is unbelievable, right? I'll give you the statistics. See about 20.5 million people depend upon the livestock for their livelihood in which livestock contributes 16% to the income of small farm households and an average of 14% to the income of all rural households so to put it in simple words livestock provides livelihood to 2/3 of rural community it also provides employment to about 8.8% of the population in india Livestock sector contributes 4.11 percentage to the GDP and 25.6 percentage to the total agriculture GDP. So this statistics makes the livestock sector important to the farmer economy. Here in this discussion I have given some of the highlights of the 20th livestock census. See the Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairying which comes under the Ministry of Fisheries Animal Husbandry and Dairying releases this census. Just know that the livestock census is conducted across the country periodically since 1919. The census usually covers all domesticated animals and head counts of these animals are taken. The enumeration was done in both rural and urban areas. Another important feature of 20th livestock census is that it has been designed to capture the breed wise number of animals and poultry birds. So based on this data from the livestock census it is said that world's highest livestock owner is India which stands at about 535.78 million it stands first in the total buffalo population second in the population of goats poultry and second in producing fish second in having aquaculture and it stands third in the population of sheep it stands fifth in the population of ducks and chicken it stands tenth in the camel population So having said that now let us see some of the issues related to the sector see in these highlights given here you can see that india today has a livestock population of approximately 536 million of this 95.8 percentage is concentrated in the rural areas despite the fact that most of the country's livestock is in rural and remote areas access to the veterinary services is a major challenge When livestock farmers need treatment for their animals they are frequently forced to travel far from their villages this has a negative influence on the longevity and productivity of the animals as well so the first issue here is accessibility to the veterinary services 
The second one is lack of proper testing and treatment facilities. Especially in this era of a sharp increase in zoonotic diseases, most villages in the country lack testing facilities and even when samples are collected, they need to be sent to the blocks or districts nearby for test results. So this is a major disadvantage for the livestock sector. And the third one is lack of proper diagnosis. In rural India, untrained animal health workers are popular because they charge less for consultations and they are more easily accessible. This has resulted in the overuse of antibiotics due to an incorrect prescription. Overuse of antibiotics will lead to antimicrobial resistance, right? So what is this antimicrobial resistance? See, it arises when an animal no longer responds to a medicine to which it was previously responsive. This not only poses problem to the livestock but also have an impact on humans as livestock is an important part of the human diet. See the connection here, right? Animal is attaining antimicrobial resistant. This is impacting humans also because human diet includes livestock. So this is a serious concern here. Moving on, according to MK Jain committee report, livestock producers have more problems than typical agricultural farmers, particularly when it comes to obtaining financing and livestock insurance. See, most livestock farmers have two to four animals per household. So, improving their livestock's longevity and productivity will go a long way toward relieving rural poverty. So, these are the issues in the livestock sector. So, to address all these issues, the government has identified a number of measures under the revised Livestock Health Disease Control Program, which is LHNDC. One such measure is implementation of a scheme named Establishment and Strengthening of Veterinary Services Mobile Veterinary Units, simply called as MVUs. The working of the scheme is very simple. There will be a mobile veterinary unit which provides services at the farmer's doorstep. See the service is coming to the farmer's doorstep. So this makes the veterinary services accessible to each and every farmer. And even doorstep services related to artificial insemination and vaccination are also provided. See this MVU is a four-wheeler van with working space for one veterinarian, one para-veterinarian and a driver come attendant. It also has space for essentials such as equipment for diagnosis, treatment and minor surgery and other requirements for the treatment of animals. It is even equipped with audio visual aids for awareness creation, GPS tracking. See, apart from this, the LHNDC scheme calls for one MVU for 1 lakh animals. However, in areas with difficult terrain, the number of vans in use can be higher. See, all of these will help to reduce the accessibility gap between urban and rural locations. Now, talking about the antimicrobial resistance. See, the MVU is in line with the One Health Vision laid down by the Global Action Plan of WHO. So, the MVU model will mitigate the issue of antimicrobial resistance as well. See, as of now, the MVUs might be restricted to the veterinary healthcare services. But in the near future, it will be focusing more on upgradation of veterinary healthcare services, disease surveillance and training, and also disease reporting in real time. And finally, the increasing adoption of MVUs across the country will lead to a surge in employment opportunities for veterinarians and assistants. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. Let's have a quick recap. We saw the importance or significance of livestock for Indian economy and for farmer economy and we saw some statistics about it which includes 20.5 million people are dependent on livestock for their livelihood and it contributes 4.1 percentage to the GDP and 25.6 percentage to the total agricultural GDP. And we saw some of the highlights from the 20th livestock census and after that we moved on to see some of the issues related to the sector which includes accessibility to the veterinary services, lack of proper testing and treatment facilities, lack of proper diagnosis, antimicrobial resistance and lack of proper dedicated scheme. And finally, we saw some of the measures by the government which included revised livestock health and disease control program LHNDC which implemented a scheme named MVU, establishment and strengthening of veterinary services, mobile veterinary units. So what is this MVU? It is the four-wheeler van with the working space for the veterinarians. 
it has essentials such as equipment for diagnosis treatment minor surgery so what does it do it makes the veterinary health care services accessible to all farmers the scheme calls for one mvu for 1 lakh animals and in addition to this the adoption of mvus will create employment opportunities with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion look at this article here this article is taken from the text and context page it talks about the recent strains in india nepal relationship the straining relationship is mainly because of the kalapani territorial dispute and the ongoing road construction in lipule pass so in this context we'll discuss about these territorial disputes in detail and we'll also see some of the solutions to the disputes but before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference kindly go through it now let's start our discussion see the main bone of contention between india and nepal is the kalapani territorial dispute The Treaty of Sugauli defines the boundary between India and Nepal. The treaty was signed between Gurkha rulers of Kathmandu and the East India Company after the Gurkha War or the Anglo-Nepal War which happened between 1814 to 1816. According to the treaty, Nepal lost the regions of Kumaon Garhwal in the west and Sikkim in the east and the Kali river constituted the boundary between Nepal and India and it is decided that the territory to the east of the river Kali belongs to Nepal but the dispute here is related to the origin of the river Kali or more precisely the dispute is mainly because of the varying interpretation of the origin of the river and its various tributaries that slice through the mountains Nepal's experts say that east of Kali river should begin at the source of the river. The source according to Nepal is in the mountains near Limpiadura which is higher in altitude than the rest of the river's flow. Nepal claims that a landmass high in mountains that falls to the east of the entire stretch starting from Limpiadura and downwards is their territory. India on the other hand says that the border begins at Kalapani and it is where the river also begins. The dispute is mainly because of this different interpretation of the origin of the river. While Nepal while Nepal's claim of the territory east of Kali is based on the Limpiadura origin, India says the river actually takes the name of Kali near Kalapani. See this region resembles a slice of cake wedged in between Limpiadura, Lipule and Kalapani. See this map here this is the disputed Kalapani territory and when we take a closer look see the Nepal claims that this is the place where the Kali river starts but India says that this is the place where the Kali river originates and the territory east of this place only belongs to Nepal See again in 1996 the treaty of Mahakali was signed between India and Nepal this treaty envisaged the Pancheshwar multipurpose hydel project In 1997 the issue of the origin of Kali river was first raised the matter was referred to the joint technical level boundary committee that had been set up in 1981 to re-identify and replace the old and damaged boundary pillars along the India Nepal border the committee clarified 98% of the boundary but note that it left behind the unresolved issues of kalapani and susta it was subsequently agreed that the matter would be discussed at the foreign secretary level you can see the location of kalapani in this map it is located in the easternmost corner of uttarakhand's pitoragarh district See this area is in India's control but Nepal claims this region because of his historical and cartographical reasons the area is the largest territorial dispute between Nepal and India consisting of at least 37000 hectares of land in the high Himalayas but now comes the real issue the survey of India issued a new political map on November 2 2019 It was the 8th edition of the political map. This was issued to reflect the change in the status of Jammu and Kashmir as two union territories. But Nepal registered a protest here even though the map in no way had changed the boundary between India and Nepal. However, on November 8, the 9th edition was issued. In the 9th edition, the delineation remained identical, but the name Kali River had been deleted. It also showed Kalapani as part of Pitoragarh district and this has led to the stronger protest with Nepal invoking foreign secretary level talk to resolve issues. 
but the matter remained pending despite reminders from Kathmandu. Take a look at these two maps. You can clearly see that the name Kali River has been deleted in the 9th edition. So Nepal in retaliation on May 22, 2020 tabled a constitutional amendment proposal to add a new area of 335 square kilometer to the Nepali territory. It included Kalapani, Limpiadura and Lipule of Uttarakhand as a part of Nepal's territory. This territory has never been reflected in a Nepali map for 170 years. This brief account illustrates the complexity underlying India-Nepal issues that cannot be solved by unilateral map making exercises. So a new 80 km road in Uttarakhand was constructed by the Border Roads Organisation. It opens a new route for Kailash Manasarovar Yatra via Lipule Pass reducing the travel time for yatris. The route is from Darchula to Lipule known as Kailash Manasarovar Yatra route. This also raised the tension. So how to resolve this issue? See the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has often spoken of the neighborhood first policy. He started with a highly successful visit to Nepal in August 2014. But the relationship deteriorated in 2015 when India first got blamed for interfering in the constitution drafting in Nepal and then India got blamed for an unofficial blockade also that generated widespread resentment against the country even though there are many constraints for India to resolve this issue it is very crucial that India resolves it sooner see China is pursuing a more assertive foreign policy It considers Nepal an important element in its growing South Asian footprint. So in that aspect it is very crucial for India to resolve the issues between India and Nepal. See for too long India invoked a special relationship based on shared culture, language, region to anchor its ties with Nepal. Today it is seen in a negative connotation. Today the Nepal feels that the special relationship denotes paternalistic India which is more often insensitive. The best solution for India and Nepal to uphold their relationship is to pause the rhetoric on territorial nationalism. Groundwork should be laid for a quiet dialogue where both sides need to display sensitivity and they should explore the way to rebuild long standing special relationship. See the bilateral understanding to resolve the boundary issues through diplomatic dialogue is the best way forward. So with this we have come to the end of our discussion. Let's have a quick recap. What all we saw today? We saw the border dispute between India and Nepal that started with the Treaty of Sugauli which says that the region east of River Kali belongs to Nepal. But the dispute now is the origin of the River Kali. India claims that the river originates at Kalapani but Nepal claims that the river originates at the region Limpiadura and we saw another bone of contention which was the new political map issued by the survey of India on November 2 2019 and after that the issue is because of the road construction by the border roads organization from Darchula to Lipule known as the Kailash Manasarovar Yatra route It was opened to reduce the travelling time for the yatris and after that we moved on to see why it is crucial for India to resolve the issue with Nepal and we finally ended the discussion by seeing the importance of ascertaining the special relationship with Nepal through diplomatic dialogue with these key takeaway points let's move on to the next article discussion See this news article here it reports that the Kadak legend Pandit Birju Maharaj passed away yesterday He is a superstar who performs with unmatched face expressions. We are not going to go deep in this issue here, but instead in this context we are going to learn about Kathak in prelims perspective. See before getting into the details of Kathak, have this basic understanding. Kathak and Kathakali are two distinct Indian dance forms. They are among the 10 Indian classical dances that are highly regarded throughout the country. See Kathak is a dance form of Uttar Pradesh, Kathakali is a dance form of Kerala. Due to the fact that they sound similar many might be misled to believe that they both are same but they are not similar at all See the word Kathak has been derived from the word Katha which means story and Kathakas or storytellers or the people who narrate stories largely based on episodes from the epics myths and legends 
See, it probably started as an oral tradition. Later, to make the recitation more effective, mime and gestures were added. This eventually led to the evolution of a simple form of expressional dance. This was later developed into Kathak as we see it today. Kathak began evolving into a distinct mode of dance in the 15th and 16th centuries with the spread of the Bhakti movement. It is primarily performed in northern India. Like I said before, it is the traditional dance form of Uttar Pradesh. So to sum up, Kathak is primarily a temple or village performance wherein the dancers narrated stories from ancient scriptures. There is another form of notable dance called Rasa Leela. See, this dance is a combination of folk dance with the basic gestures of Kathak storytellers that highlights the stories of Radha and Krishna. Now talking about the style that is the dance style of Kathak, it is usually a solo performance. It was also influenced by Persian costumes and styles of dancing. The dancer often passes to recite the verses that is the dialogues followed by their execution through movement. Here in this dance more emphasis is given to the footwork. The movements are skillfully controlled and performed straight legged by dancers wearing ankle belts. See Kathak is the only form of classical dance that is associated with Hindustani or North Indian music. Some of the famous proponents of Kathak dance are Birju Maharaj, Lachu Maharaj, Sitara Devi, Damayanti Joshi. So with this we have come to the end of our discussion. What all we saw today? We saw the difference between Kathak and Kathakali. We saw the characteristics of Kathak and some of its features and we moved on to see about the dance style of Kathak that is the solo performance which gives more emphasis to footwork. And we saw that it is a traditional dance form of Uttar Pradesh. So with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Look at this article. This is with reference to tsunami in Tonga. See, an extensive damage was caused in the Pacific island nation of Tonga following a massive underwater volcanic eruption and tsunami. In this context, we are going to learn about tsunami and its impact from prelims point of view. See, tsunami is a Japanese word meaning extremely high sea wave. A tsunami is a series of extremely long waves caused by a large and sudden displacement of the ocean. See most tsunamis are caused by earthquakes on converging tectonic plate boundaries. According to the Global Historical Tsunami Database, since 1900, over 80 percentage of tsunamis were generated by earthquakes. Seismologist opines that only earthquakes measuring greater than 7.0 on the Richter scale can produce a major tsunami. However, tsunamis can also be caused by landslides, volcanic activity, certain type of weather events possibly near earth objects such as asteroids and comets colliding with or exploding above the ocean let us understand in detail see the earth's lithosphere is broken up into a bunch of discrete pieces called plates that move around the surface of the earth there are major plates and minor plates based on their sizes This motion is driven by the flow of mantle rock beneath the plates and by the forces plates exert at their boundaries where they touch each other. So the motion is driven by two factors one is by the flow of mantle the other one is by the forces exerting at the boundaries of the plate where they touch each other. Earthquakes happen when plates move with respect to each other because of the friction and this stress at the edges of the plates prevents them from slipping smoothly at their boundaries. A subduction zone occurs when two tectonic plates meet and one plate slides beneath the other. So, when one plate is forced to dive beneath the other plate, there is no way to do it except with some component of vertical motion creating tsunami. Look at this figure for better understanding. See when one plate is sliding beneath the other one because of the friction, the waves are formed. See tsunamis have very large wavelength this is only the wavelength since they have large wavelength it will lose its energy as it propagates as a tsunami leaves the deep water of the ocean sea and propagates into the more shallow waters near the coast it undergoes a transformation what is the transformation the speed of the tsunami is related to the water depth 
so when the depth of the water decreases the speed of the tsunami also decreases therefore the speed of the tsunami decreases as it enters the shallow water that is near the coast but eventually the height of the wave will grow as you can see in this image here see tsunamis are among the most infrequent hazards they do not occur very often and most are small and non destructive but they pose a major threat to coastal communities particularly in the pacific region because 78 percentage of the pacific ocean around the ring of fire is prone to tsunami a tsunami can strike any ocean coast at any time there is no season for tsunamis we cannot predict when where or how destructive the next tsunami will be so the tsunamis cannot be prevented However, there are certain precautions that you can do before, during and after a tsunami. These precautions could save many lives and they are taken by the government around the world from time to time. The first and foremost thing is we should stay away from hazard zones such as earthquake zones which causes tsunamis. Another method of protection is the use of sea walls in front of ports and cities. Proper planting of trees, mangroves and corals can also effectively used to mitigate tsunami. So that's all about this article. We'll have a quick recap. What all we saw today? We saw Japanese word tsunami and what does it mean which means a series of extremely long waves caused by sudden large displacement of ocean and we also saw how they are generated when one plate slides beneath the other one the friction caused by the subduction results in tsunami waves and we also saw some of its characteristics which include the speed of the wave is directly proportional to its water depth So if the depth of the water decreases the speed of the tsunami also diminishes but the speed and the height of the wave is indirectly proportional that is if the speed of the tsunami decreases it makes the height of the wave to grow which is near the shore and we finally ended our discussion by seeing some of the precautions that you can take before during and after tsunami with these key takeaway points let's move on to the next part of our discussion that is the practice prelims questions We have four prelims questions here. Two of them are previous year questions. Two of them are practice questions. For the previous year questions, you are going to give me the answer, and I'll solve the other two questions. Let's start with this first previous year question that was asked in 2018. The question says: International Labour Organisation's Convention 138. and 182 are related to option a child labor option b adaptation of agricultural practices to global climate change option c regulation of food prices and food security option d gender parity at the workplace so this is a very easy question we have discussed this fact in our discussion also so try to give your answer in the comment section moving on to the next question consider the following statements The origin of Kathak is traditionally attributed to the travelling bards in the ancient northern India known as Kathakas or storytellers. Statement 2 Kathak is divided into three separate styles known as gharanas. Which of the following statements given above is or are correct? See in this question both the statements are correct. Regarding the first statement given here we have seen in our discussion that Kathak is traditionally attributed to Kathakas or storytellers. In coming to the second statement it is divided into three separate gharanas or styles which are named after the places where the kathak dance tradition evolved i'll tell you what are those three gharanas one is jaipur gharana banaras gharana lucknow gharana so the correct option here is option c both 1 and 2 moving on to the next question this is also a previous year question which was asked in 2011 The question is the 2004 tsunami made people realize that mangroves can serve as a reliable safety hedge against coastal calamities how do mangroves function as a safety hedge option a the mangrove swamps separate the human settlements from the sea by a wide zone in which people neither live nor went out The mangroves provide both food and medicines which people are in need of after any natural disaster. The mangrove trees are tall with dense canopies and serve as an excellent shelter during a cyclone or tsunami. Option D, the mangrove trees do not get uprooted by storms and tides because of their extensive roots. 
Like I said, it is a previous year question. You are only going to give me the answer here. It is a very simple question. Try your logics here and post the correct answer in the comment section. Moving on to the next question. The tsunami can be caused by which of the following? Earthquakes, landslides, volcanic activity, near earth objects. Which of the following statements is our correct? This is also a very easy question. In our discussion, we saw that tsunami is caused by all of these four elements. When two plates converge, the subduction causes friction which results in earthquakes. If this happens under the ocean or where the ocean is there, then this earthquake will lead to tsunami. Landslides in some places also lead to tsunami. The very recent example, the volcanic eruption in Tonga resulted in tsunami, right? So, option 3 is also right. Near earth objects also causes tsunami if it explodes or collides in the ocean plate. So, the right option here is option D, 1, 2, 3 and 4. I have given some of the main questions for your practice. So, interested candidates, write it and post it in the comment section. So, with this we have come to the end of our discussion. If you find the video useful, please like, share and comment. And do subscribe to the Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.